You're listening to the Hayek Program podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Hi, my name is Jamie Lemke. I'm a senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. And my guest for this fifth episode in our Liberalism for All series is Dr. Nick Cowan senior lecturer in the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Lincoln, that's in the UK, not Nebraska for listeners in the United States. And uh, Nick teaches key social science concepts, human rights, social issues and social justice, images of crime, applying research. He also has a really impressive set of, of publications within the broad realm of PPE. Uh, Nick is the author of Neoliberal Social Justice, Rawls Unveiled, out just last year from Edward Elgar. So we're going to talk a good bit about that book in this discussion. And Nick uh, describes this book in a phrase as his progressive defense of commercial society. And Nick and I are going to talk about what that implies for the relationship between liberalism and equality, as well as some of the other big picture implications uh, that he draws for policy and for thinking about democratic societies and democratic relationships. We return to the question of the difference between arbitrary inequalities stemming from the exercise of discretionary power and the inevitable and maybe even desirable inequalities in experience, in skills, in wants. So that's something that Michaela Novak introduced in an earlier episode in this series. Um, but Nick has some, some new thoughts to share as well. We talk some about the political ideas of John Rawls. A big piece of what Nick is doing in this book is pushing for what he sees as a more consistent interpretation of Rawlsian principles. So he asks questions like, How might a Rawlsian framework be different if we seriously considered how institutions will function after we've stepped outside of the veil of ignorance? Or what if we interpreted markets not in the neoclassical way that John Rawls seemed to have in mind, but instead in more of an Austrian market process framework that emphasizes robust individual market participation in order to adapt, learn, and innovate? Um, Nick also has an interesting, what you might call an institutionalist perspective on the relationship between capitalism and inequality. We talk about the importance of economic rights and meaningful economic participation and touch on the age-old debate of whether market exchange is a healthy way to interact with other human beings or whether it's a toxic way to interact with other human beings. Um, Nick gives us his argument for why he thinks market participation can actually help people develop their moral powers. So they can help us become more moral because as we negotiate, as we interact in ways that require us to get along with strangers and to relate to people who are different from us, uh, we can actually build upon those moral powers and build our moral intuitions and our social skills. And this can in turn have a substantial impact on our ability to interact with each other as equals in a democratic setting. In terms of policy, which we get to towards the the end of the conversation and Nick gets to towards the end of his book, we talk about housing as an area that's particularly ripe for reform, where even modest changes could make a big difference in equality of opportunity and equality of access. And further, many of those housing reforms that Nick has in mind are consistent with the liberal ideal of making it easier for people to negotiate their own agreements. Um, which for me brings back up a theme that has come up in other episodes of this podcast, which is that law and regulation can often create rigidities that are both illiberal and entrench inequality. So progress towards liberalism can often go hand in hand 
with progress towards this vision of a society of moral equals, dignified equals. Um, so with that, I invite you to hear the rest from Dr. Nick Cowan. Welcome, Nick. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, and I also just want to congratulate you on this wonderful book that you've created, Neoliberal Social Justice, Rawls and Veiled. It's, it's a very impressive piece of scholarship, and a lot of people are going to really find a lot of value in it. So congratulations on that. Oh, thank you, Jamie. It's been it's great to be speaking to you today. And uh, as as you know, um, a number of pieces of the book have been inspired by uh, you know um, uh, my conversations with you and your colleagues at Mercatus uh, over the years, and uh, that uh, glorious Adam Smith Fellowship program that uh, kind of really <laughs> drilled in Hayek and Buchanan uh, in, in, into me in a way that I uh, uh, was not was not fully cognizant um, when when I started my PhD. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful! What a lovely compliment for our program. So. <laughs> Thank you so much Absolutely. for that. Absolutely, highly recommend the Adam Smith Fellowship for young for young graduates, <laughs> or not he, so I, young graduates. <laughs> I just want to know he was not paid to say that, and is not paid to be <laughs> here today. <laughs> um, so uh, to start off, uh, entering this conversation about liberalism and equality and their relationship, I want to set the stage by asking you what liberalism means to you and what role that concept plays in your scholarship. Well, I, I think I take a fairly mainstream line on what liberalism means. Uh, you know, I, I come up with slightly different policy conclusions about what it means. But basically, it's a commitment to allow people to experiment in their own lives, formulate and pursue what matters to them, uh, as well as the freedom to believe what you want and associate with uh, whoever you want. And how do you think about the relationship between either that concept or the history of that ideology and the idea of equality. So how do those two fit together? And hopefully we can return to this through the conversation, but how do those two fit together in your mind? Well, I, I suppose to kind of characterize it broadly, I think it's a close but tense relationship. So they are close in that everyone needs to have access to an equal set of rights to pursue their own ends uh, without suffering violence or coercion. So everyone needs an equal set of rights. I think everyone kind of agrees with that. And I think increasingly, um, many of us would agree, including on the classical li liberal end, that we that people need access to resources and certain forms of capital, such as education, in order to effectively pursue their life goals. Now, the tension comes in in that individual experiments, that is departures from existing way of doing things, can mean that people are going to end up in a wide variety of social and economic circumstances through the various choices that they make and the kind of fortunes uh, that, they, that they encounter uh, as a result. Um, moreover, innovation or sort of change in the social structure or the way that we're doing things, the set of practices that people are commonly doing, that annoys people who benefit from the status quo. Uh, and whether people are experimenting with different moral frameworks or a different kind of economic enterprise, a, an egalitarian intuition can be distorted in order to kind of come out in favor of conformity. So in other words, you've got all this kind of messy experimentation going on. Um, some people are going to end up in much better circumstances. Some experiments are going to pay off a lot more than others, whether in the form of, of economic uh, um you know, in terms of income and wealth, or just kind of status or knowledge or just social position that you end up in. And seeing all this messiness, there can be a tendency for egalitarians to think like, uh, this is kind of awkward. It would be better if we kind of constrained that, that ability to innovate a little bit. But uh, on my account, we do need uh, that, 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 that as well. So I think what we, what we need to talk about is the rights that people need and also um, the resources that people need in order to pursue those experiments, but not the curtailing of those experiments. So when you talk about people needing an equal set of rights, what are you what are they needing them for? Are, are we needing those in order to have a just society? Are we needing those in order to have a society at all to, to hold us together? Or, or is it something else you had in mind? Um, well, I, 
I, I guess yes, it's interesting because my definition of liberalism uh, doesn't doesn't really include uh, justice. Uh, at least, in, 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 at least in there, it's saying that it's it's just a commitment to allowing people to pursue their own lives. And so, ultimately, these if you think that's an important part of um, you know what it is to be a, a human being in society, so you know we're pursuing these projects often jointly, um, then uh, your conception of justice is going to you know kind of is, is, going to be, is going to be based around that. So, in other words, you need these basic sets of rights. Um, you know, the ones that liberals agree on tend to be things like. Uh, commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of association, um, various forms of uh, bodily autonomy and security of the person uh, under the rule of law. That's that stuff we all kind of agree on. Uh, and that's going to be necessary ultimately because we want people to be able to pursue their own goals and not be constantly coerced and manipulated into achieving other people's ends. So we need equal rights in order to be free, in order to be in a liberal society. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Great. I, yeah, I like that. I like that formulation. Um, so you begin neoliberal social justice by asking which policies might be able to limit uh, what you call arbitrary socioeconomic inequalities. Can you just say a little bit about what makes an inequality arbitrary or not arbitrary? Well, yeah, that's a rather controversial question. So classically, we would think of uh, inequalities uh, that emerge as a result of characteristics that you have no control over. Th so things like family resources, class, class ethnicity, uh, gender assignment. Um, Rawlsians add to that uh, things like talent and capacity for effort, none of which you really choose on his account. You're kind of like various things to do with the way that um, your upbringing and um, the circumstances of your birth, uh, they're going to be what determine even those things as well. Things that other people might think are highly relevant uh, to, to, kind, to the kinds of uh, inequalities that you, that you get. And I think on the whole, I'm happy to accept that characterization because in the book, I can show that we can accept those as ultimately um, arbitrary from a moral point of view, at least. Um, and I can still show that we can justify some inequalities um, of uh, the, 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 that emerge from, from that kind. We have to be very careful about justifying them, but they can be justified. Now, another distinction, which um, is, is very important, perhaps at a slightly sort of lower level of analysis, is um, uh, a distinction that Hayekians place a great deal of emphasis on. And that is between inequalities that emerge as a result of someone's arbitrary power to manipulate pe other people's available choices and those that emerge kind of spontaneously through the kind of free play of um, uh, trial and error and experimentation. So what's good about markets on my account is that people's individual capacity to manipulate and threaten others is limited um, because people are free to try and find other cooperators to deal with. In that sense, inequalities that emerge from markets are not arbitrary um, in the sense that no one was able to predict which inequalities would emerge from people's spontaneous decisions and experimentation. So inequalities emerge, they're not wholly justified because there's nothing particularly meriting about those inequalities. But one upside of markets is that at least there wasn't someone in control and saying, oh, I'm going to reward this person for this reason, this arbitrary reason that I've decided is important, and this other person. Instead, it's a free play of, um, of a lot of factors that, uh, that produce really unpredictable results. Um, and if the framework is set correctly, broadly beneficial uh, results for everyone, including those who happen to end up on top in a, in a given period. Yeah, although, of course, that's one of the million dollar questions you're dealing with in this book and one of the big sources of controversy, whether whether capitalism is going to be a source of arbitrary inequality and whether increasing reliance on capitalism is necessarily going to lead to increases in that ability to manipulate and in that ability to to use power against others and generate arbitrary inequality. Um What's your perspective on that question? So controversially, um, at least in many political theory circles, I argue that uh, capitalism is not um, inextricably linked to inequality. There are certainly tendencies within capitalism as existing today that have pushed towards greater inequality, but they aren't inherent to capitalism. Um, and the reason for this 
uh, I think I the reason why I come away from, uh, I suppose, a lot of mainstream opinion on, on this is that in the sort of broadly neoclassical tradition, especially people like Arthur Oaken in the United States, James Mead in the United Kingdom, and uh, Thomas Piketty in France, and now globally, um, th they argue that capital has a sort of self-accumulating property to it. Once you have enough of it, such that you don't have to consume it, it just grows uh, through what Mead actually famously calls the magic of compound interest. So up to a certain point, and uh, uh, Piketty has various uh, arguments for, for, for why um, you end up with, um, with uh, um, you know, more agglomerations of wealth needs to more, more, more rapid growth as well, and therefore greater accumulation. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's like one simplified model for what's going on, but it's not the only thing that's going on in a real world market economy. So from an Austrian perspective, capital needs constant maintenance and reconfiguring in order to grow in the midst of ri risk and uncertainty. Uh, so existing enterprises are apt to be disrupted through the process of creative destru destruction. That's, a, that's an observation from uh, Schumpeter. So there are a lot of leveling opportunities within capitalism itself. There are kind of endogenous forms that are going to break up um, various agglomerations of capital once we realize that it's not just a number on a spreadsheet, but rather it's kind of real instantiations of capital goods that um, are going to be, that are going to spoil or going to be used or are going to have to be refined and reconfigured in order to keep their value as other people are competing to build up their capital structure. Now, some families continue to be wealthy through a combination of luck and, to some extent, prudence. So, you know, you'll see famous families that kind of manage to do this. Um, I'm not quite sure how typical that is of like, of, of, of the sort of just, just the typical wealthy elite. Certainly some people, some families can um, end up dispersing their wealth and they just disappear off into being, uh, you know, ordinary members of the, um, of, 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 of the middle class, even under the existing unfair regime that we've got. Um, some wealthy families manage, through, manage to keep their wealth through blending their interests with the political elite. Um, now, on my account, that's not an intrinsic problem with liberal markets. Rather, it's a question of how you realistically civilise political elites and make them happy to permit the market economy in general. At the elite level, you've got a lot of, you know, shall we say, entanglement that, that is going on. And sometimes those entanglements don't look very fair you know, they're kind of outside what we might think of justice as fairness, because it really is about power politics and the way people are throwing their wealth around. Um, but if the overall effect is that the elite tends to leave, you know, ordinary market participants alone to uh, work and experiment, then you still see growth and you still see opportunities for people to uh, to succeed. So on a kind of realistic basis, I'm uh, I, I feel that there that, um, uh, that there's a. Uh, there's good reasons to believe why capitalism can still be uh, uh, quite leveling in its in its overall approach, even if there is like a tiny elite at the top that likes to keep its power indefinitely. Yeah, one of the ideas that you propose in the book that I that that grabbed my interest, and maybe this was more a hypothesis than something you've been able to fully flesh out for yourself yet, but but you suggest that being extremely wealthy can isolate you from actual market participation, having to make trade-offs, having to negotiate with people in a way that allows you to kind of develop the social skills that market activity can bring and develop the, you know, the understanding of trade-offs in the real world that market activity can bring. So you suggest that being very wealthy can actually wind up having a similar impact on your economic decision-making as not having economic rights. And that stood out to me as a, I don't know if you remember this discussion, um, but, but that stood out to me as potentially an interesting idea because that, that's kind of one way that capitalism within itself has a mechanism that prevents excessive accumulations of wealth. And I think it shows up in a lot of the social science data that, as you suggested, you know, second generation or third generation after someone becomes extremely wealthy, often most of that is dissipated. Not, not always, but, but pretty often. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, uh, I mean, you're, you're right to identify it as, as a, yeah, it was an interesting idea that I had. And I suppose it kind of reflects a little bit, um, you know, sort of Mises's um, observation that, you know, like the, you know, the sons and daughters of the kind of the rich elite that he saw uh, tended to uh, develop a somewhat sort of capricious mentality, uh, which was not very geared towards the real world or real world uh, governance. And I think that might have been an example of kind of Misesian kvetching on some level. I think, you know, it's very hard for people to kind of get a grip on on what, you know, it's very hard to live a good life. It takes a lot of practice. Um, and and in my in my opinion, um, you know, the, the um, you know, engaging in economic and economic activity, whether it's just working for a living um, or, you know, starting a business or trying to be involved in in running a business um, or um, or just being involved in trying to run any kind of organization where economic calculation and, you know, where there are trade offs that you're facing. All of that, I think, is 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 a sort of useful skill for understanding the difficulty of living, you know, kind of getting getting by with one another when there are when there are trade offs, when people disagree about what what is what is very valuable. Um, and so, yeah, no, it, it, I think it is true that a lot of people um, at the at the very very rich end are going to struggle, especially you know in the early years of their life to to recognize you know all these things and get those kind of experiences. Now, I'm not so worried about them, you know, I, in this in that I do feel that you know it's important to support people at the lower end who, who are unable to participate because they lack the resources um, or they, they lack the right milieu to kind of participate in these things and to actually become a, a, a agentic because, um, because of the community that they're in. The, the, the option for rich families is obviously to uh, constrain how many resources they give to their children at various points and, and, and say, well, you know, there's always the option of like introducing an environment that, uh, that, that, that people, you know, from, from a, from a rich background you know can actually learn it's just possible that they won't have to and depending on the way that the you know the the, the family upbringing works it may be that they they do lack some of the some of the the skills some of those, those kind of social and moral skills that i think are important um so yeah um so if you do find you know rich trust affarians around who seem a little bit uh, uh misunderstanding over like basics of of um you know social interaction well maybe that's part of what's going on possibly yeah, and it's it's definitely not to say, oh, poor poor rich babies, We're, we feel so sorry for you because it's clearly better from a moral perspective and from a perspective of of liberalism and of justice to at least have the option to live your life in that different way. Whereas if you're actually denied economic rights, you don't even have the the option to live that would in a way that would allow you to develop those skills and exercise your agency but it it, it does seem to to offer an interesting explanation Pre of some of what precisely it's what the new yorkers would call an uptown problem yeah yes. it's a problem but it's uptown <laughs> but we have to think about we have to think about what's going on elsewhere as well yeah <laughs> all right let's get back to the core argument so um for for many of your fellow uh political theorists they'll likely be extremely familiar with this um argument already um but for those who are not, could you uh, just explain to us the concept of justice as fairness? What what it means to to in, in the Rawlsian tradition to think about that idea? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, although although I, I'm so steeped in the Rawlsian tradition, I, I have this perhaps rather um, controversial belief that first and foremost, it's a slogan as well as an article title and a book title. Uh, and so ultimately, it can be unpacked in a number of ways. But in essence, it is the belief that just institutions are those that would be selected by, or at least agreeable to, people who end up among the least advantaged in a political community. In the abstract, this means institutions that would be selected in a hypothetical choice situation, where people do not know the circumstances that they're going to end up in after that hypothetical choice situation has been made. So that's the, the famous original position um, where people make a decision behind what Rawls calls a veil of ignorance, where, uh, where people are not aware of their conception of the good, um, they're not aware of, um, you know, their um, their identity characteristics, and they're not even aware of their talents or their, um, uh, you know, or, or things like their capacity to engage in effort um, or, or whatnot. They don't they don't know their personality traits either, basically. Um, so, in those circumstances, what would you select? Um, and uh, that's the um, 
uh, that 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 would be justice as fairness. So that would be that would be a set of fair institutions. Um, more concretely, I think people generally take institutions where people can see economic positions and social status as distributed according to transparent procedures that apply equally to all as more le- legitimate than alternatives. So that's that's something that that sort of comes up, you know, in the kind of uh, social psychology literature that uh, people. Um, are quite uh, they're they're quite tolerant of some degree of inequality so long as it kind of makes sense in that it wasn't kind of just well once again arbitrarily doled out to people rather it was due to a process that was in principle um, uh, fair so that's what that's what justice as fairness is about. So your subtitle Raws Unveiled. This is because you're pulling aside the veil of ignorance by looking at some of these questions about how this operates when we don't have that artificial construction is that right um yeah or am i trying am i trying um, to be too clever about interpreting that (laughs) uh, no it's um i mean the the first reason i called it rules unveiled is because bizarrely no one else had used that title yet even though see the two words seem to go very very closely together it's it's just standing right there yeah uh so that that was um but i in in so far as it connects with um with, uh, with 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 my core argument, uh, essentially, what we're what we're doing is is we have to ask the people behind the veil have to think about the way that people are going to behave once that veil has been lifted, uh, and rules uh, only does that to a certain extent, and it does it quite quite unevenly. So if there's going to be problems in like the marketplace. Well, that's just that's just very easily perceptible to the um, the people who are um, behind the veil. They're instantly going to see, oh, there's going to be market failures here. We're going to need public goods uh, to be provided here because, of course, rationally self interested individuals are going to be incapable of dealing with these things without government intervention. So he's very good at kind of saying, oh yeah, yeah, no, you have to be realistic about these these kinds of problems. Um, but when it comes to the political process, he's instead got this kind of hope where people are going to be committed to free and equal citizenship, as they are behind the veil by construction, they have to be because they don't know where they're going to be. So obviously, they're going to be very careful about where they're going to place the disadvantaged. Um, But what's going to happen once people uh, 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 have the veil lifted off and they enter the political process? Well, um, I argue, you know, that there is a case for some sort of symmetry there, because um, various forms of mass political um, activity, um, you know, essentially large scale voting, large scale legislating, large bureaucracies, all these things have many of the same properties of exchange, uh, you know, within, uh, you know, within within your local milieu that markets have. And they produce aggregate properties. You know, the aggregate outcomes of a bureaucracy are not really intended by anyone. They're rather the result of lots and lots of state steps and stages of, of individuals solving particular local problems in their little bureau um, with legislators looking over them, but not really having that much of an idea what's going on on a day to day. There's like, you know, very little understanding um, uh, about how these large scale processes, uh, how these large scale processes work. And so for that reason, you would expect some of the similar behaviors that you see uh, in market activity, where people are only concerned about their little, their little bundle of property rights, their little enterprise or the work that they're doing, and they're just trying to get by. You'd see a lot of that taking place in a large scale political organization as well. Um, so, so that's, that's basically my case for symmetry. And when you lift up the veil, you're going to go like, okay, um, people are not going to be super expert, multi- multiply talented, and very, very saintly individuals and citizens when operating the political process, at least if you're not going to make that assumption for markets as well. You know, so, so that, that's, that's, basically, that, that's basically the main point I want to make in the, in the whole book. More or less all of it comes out of that, that particular symmetry argument. Yeah, that's fantastic. That, that core question of how a person would want to think about policies that would enable us to pursue a society that meets those requirements of justice as fairness. You know, if someone wanted to pursue those kinds of policies, they need to consider what actually would be a realistic set of assumptions about human nature and a realistic set of assumptions about other policy and social processes in order to actually achieve 
that goal. Um, so, so that's kind of my, my restatement of kind of what you just said and what you write in the book about what, what your central question is. So um, I'd like to you know, invite you to um, correct me if I've left anything really important out. That was a very short shum- summary, obviously, of, uh, you know, very exhaustive work. Um, but then also just to to give people the, you know, the not the, I guess the flavor of the book, but but really to to let them understand what is most important about it and your contribution. Could you just articulate what you think the most significant challenges that your m- realistic or practical or symmetrical approach mm-hmm. is offering to a, a more traditional interpretation? Um, so I think the key thing is to be aware of self-interest and limited knowledge at every level of society, you know, from the, the bottom up. Uh, you know, like from 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 the ground where everyone is kind of you know always very keen to point out where errors are to the elite level where there's also a lot of elite ignorance. Um, and so what you have to do is design policies so that they'll work reasonably well, even if many of the people trying to implement them will behave quite badly and often out of ignorance. And in addition, the most stable institutions are those that are effectively self-enforcing, um, or where you have different actors that are incentivized to hold each other accountable. Um, And the way I see it, this challenges some Rawlsian approaches to public policy, especially those that come from the left, sometimes from further to the left than Rawls himself. It's, uh, you know, he's he's, he's, he's definitely of the left, but there are people who try and push push it further. And they tend to justify concentrating a great deal of economic power and resources into state institutions that will be supposedly supervised by a competitive democratic process and also a powerful supreme judiciary. Uh, that's when they're thinking in United States terms. When you're thinking in British terms, it's back to just competitive democracy, basically, is the idea. Um, and my point is that everywhere along the chain, from voters to politicians to the bureaucrats or civil servants, as we call them in the UK, that implement these policies or, or are going to control these economic um, uh, these these powerful uh, economic institutions, you will see widespread institu- widespread ignorance and individual interest at play. Um, and uh, and I think once you do that, you start to realize why um, uh, a large a um, a w- w- why a defense of a substantial sphere for private economic activity seems to be more justified on Rawlsian grounds after all. So, so so long as we apply that kind of symmetrical argument. So you suggest in the book that part of the reason Rawls deprioritized economic liberty is that he was operating from a particular economic framework. So he was operating in a neoclassical framework that emphasized models of perfect competition, of monopoly and what would be required to correct a monopoly. Um, What is it specifically about that neoclassical approach to economic theory that makes economic rights seems so unimportant when you use that as your as your base for understanding how an economy operates well i i think i i kind of go back to buchanan on on this kind of um on this kind of core observation and uh, it's basically the distinction between treating the economy as an allocative mechanism as a kind of unitary agent that's going to uh, you know allocate resources to where they are most valuably valuably placed um Uh, And that's like the core reason for the market economy. If you have that allocative idea and you've got your theory of perfect competition and complete knowledge and rational agents in mind, then you kind of don't need private economic agents at all. Uh, You could just have, um, you know, a series of overlapping bureaucracies or maybe a series of um, maybe cooperatives. So, you know, kind of um, uh, unowned cooperatives or or where the capital is ultimately owned by the state. And what you do is you, you know, you set the rules in such a way that the individuals there are incentivized just to follow the market prices that are out there somewhere. They just need to, you know, they'll they'll, they'll follow them. if instead we take uh, the knowledge problem seriously, we realize that the prices and the, the value that goods have are not given, but rather they are discovered 
through um, trial and error processes, then suddenly you need to have um, private economic actors brought back in because they're the ones who are making conjectures, basically their best guesses about where resources can be valuably um, uh, placed um, with a lot of error and waste along the way, a lot of failed experiments. But the overall result is you, you end up with uh, a price system that better reflects um, the the underlying opportunity costs of each um, of, of, of how each good, you know, both the consumer goods and also the intermediate goods that go into production, um, how 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 valuable they are, um, and um, that doesn't really make sense from a perspective of an economy as uh, being a simple allocative mechanism. Rather, it's uh, an, the economy as an exchange mechanism. So it's people with sets of resources um, that they've, they've they've got for whatever reason in, pre- in previous periods or that they've just discovered that were hitherto unknown but have now now be conceptualized as potentially valuable resources um, at that point um, uh, people are figuring out how they can best be used and the only way to do it is to do you know bids and asks you know kind of put 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 out, put out what you can offer out there and also sit, see what other people are offering and say, yeah, I can give you this much. It would make sense for me to offer you this much and it would fit into my particular you know, entrepreneurial plan, my, um, you know, w- what I'm trying to achieve either by myself or with my co-workers or colleagues or uh, business partners, that sort of, that, 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 that sort of thing. And um, uh, that, that suddenly means that economic rights are very important. Because without economic rights, without people actually having real property that they can risk and actually lose, you know, without it being like a big deal, it's just it was just yours. So it was yours to lose as well as yours to gain from. Um, you don't have that ability to produce the information that's necessary for discovering what kind of enterprises enterprises work. Um, so um, that's that's the that's the sort of mundane reason for why economic rights matter. Um, you know, I can I can also come in on why they might be right from why they might be important from a moral perspective as well. But we've kind of already discussed a little bit about that with respect to uh, to um, you know the, uh, the the children of, of of very wealthy elites. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, as long as we're there, um, why don't why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because I you have this really nice section in the book where you go through the ways that you think economic activity is. So the argument you just gave is more about why economic activity is essential in order to kind of have an economy at all and to get the level of economic growth that enables people to get the things they they need and can survive on. Um, it also relates to just being able to maintain a peaceful social order, because if you're in economic decline, then you get a lot of uh, scrabbling and fighting over resources. Whereas if you have some level of economic growth, you're able to adapt to change in a way that doesn't generate so much conflict. Um, but But you also have this section where you talk about economic activity being important for the individual in a moral way as well. Um, And you actually use the phrase that being involved in market activity can help us develop our moral powers. Um, So what, what do you mean by that? So moral powers is is a is a rather sort of controversial and rather critiqued uh, piece of the Rawlsian machinery, which are basically uh, one's capacity to formulate a conception of justice uh, and one's uh, ability to formulate your own conception of the good. Um, and for the most part, I focus on justice, uh, although I think there probably is a case for saying that uh, market activity can help develop a conception of the good as well. Um, and I think they're both kind of connected in the sense that um, what markets you know, typically do is that they, um, uh, so economic activity, you know, essentially activity where your ability to contribute is is going to be very important for like you know whether you whether you manage to get a a a good job or or, or not or, or like you're going to receive feedback about whether you're you're you're, you're doing well or not. It, it tends to involve dealing with people who you would not otherwise meet in your kind of local social milieu. So in other words, you get exposed to a much wider variety of people outside of your initial community. So commerce. Uh, is both extremely attractive and also sometimes considered quite dangerous for precisely this reason. It puts people in contact with uh, with one another that you would otherwise don't have very uh, very strong interests in. 
Um, and in fact, uh, I, I would argue that it's this sort of like commercial activity that actually makes an initial political community possible, because rather than, you know, just dealing with your initial family and maybe, I don't know, your your local lord or something, if it would have been in the, in, you know, in the kind of medieval era, instead, you're dealing with hundreds of people, potentially thousands of people over the course of a year. Um, uh, and um, uh, and they are reliant on you, maybe just for a snippet while you just deliver this particular thing that you're specializing in. Uh, but at that moment, they are reliant on you and you are reliant on them. Uh, and yet you don't actually have that much reason to trust them on an individual level. There's not really anything that's really, you know, you don't know anything about them. But because they're participating in this institution and because they've got to where they are and you've got to where you are, you kind of realize, OK, uh, positionally, we seem to be able to, um, to 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 do well here. You know, you can you, you can wander around. I can hand over money and expect some change back. Uh, I can hand over money in advance and expect that the service will be rendered. You know, we are very disappointed when it doesn't happen. And one of the reasons why, uh, uh, why, why, why that, why we are is because it often does, because people realize that sooner or later it's going to, you know, it's going to come back in the form of reputation um, or, or lack of credibility if we don't participate fairly in this, in this system. And that means that there's a kind of sense of generalized trust, which um, is very important for basically realizing the, interests of distant strangers but nevertheless within your political community count the same they are in the same position as you are they're in symmetrical they're in a symmetrical position and therefore um, when you're faced with the um, uh, with what kind of political institutions to build you're going to have more egalitarian you have a more egalitarian sense of what those institutions should be you're not going to say well I need rights and privileges like for me and mine um, because, you know, I trust them and, you know, we're better people. It's going to be like, well, uh, actually, I see my own people up front and I can see they're fallible. You're going to see the people who are up close to you and their fallibility is a lot more. But I see all these distant people and actually when I'm dealing with them, you know, they're not, they're not being generous, but they're not being cruel either. They have to be on a certain level. They have to be just. They have to treat me fairly because otherwise I can deal with other people. Um, and so it's a kind of like training, uh, a kind of training environment for people realizing um, the sorts of, of um, uh, practices and, uh, and observations that you would make in order to participate in a liberal political community. Um, another feature of market participation is um, you're going to sometimes lose, at least relative to others. Hopefully everyone gains on, on some level, you know. Uh, you can see people speeding out ahead of you on various, you know, on various margins. But if you've got a job and you're, um, you know, and and uh, and you're participating, contributing, then hopefully you're going to be better off. In fact, a lot better off than if you weren't participating at all. Uh, and hopefully, continuously better off. In a growing economy, you should be like gaining gaining a share of those gains, even if you're doing roughly the same thing from one year to another. Um, and uh, what 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 happens is. Um, in, in, a, in a political, in a liberal political um, system, we have to be aware that sometimes other political parties are going to win or other policies are going to win, ones that we didn't approve of. Um, just in the same way that in the market economy, some people are going to get out ahead and we're going to have to get used to that as well. Um, but the, um, but um, insofar as we realise that we're all benefiting from participation and that even if like the specific details of the way the society works and not quite to our liking. The fact that we've got a society and we've got everyone participating and everyone's overall, benef uh, overall benefiting from that is, um, is reassuring. And that means that we carry on and we keep participating and we still try to win. Everyone wants to come out and win, you know, at least every now and then. Um, but um, we, we don't have to like win every time or else the whole system is like, oh, the whole system is rigged or something. We have to say, you know, we, we, we realize that the system doesn't have to deliver us the goods every time um, uh, for it nevertheless to be to be fair. That's interesting. So then markets could even, in, in that conceptualization, markets could even be something of a, a training ground for democratic relations because we're learning how to negotiate with each other, how to how to compromise and how to not always have to win. So, so that reminds me of an argument that Vincent Ostrom made fairly regularly about there being democratic ways of relating to each other in all aspects of lives. And any skills of that sort that we develop in one arena can potentially translate into another arena. I, I've always thought that ability to develop that particular way of relating to each other 
I've always found that to be a compelling explanation for why there's often a, a symbiotic relationship between successful market organization and successful democratic organization. We often see those two um, coexisting side by side. And if one is unstable, it often destabilizes the other as well. Um, so it, that's a really, really interesting perspective. Um, I have another, I have another question, but did, do you want to respond to that before I go on? Oh, well, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think, I think you've really kind of put, put um, your, um, yeah, you, you put your finger on a, on a, on a, on a key point there. Um, and I think it might actually be the difference between, you know, like neo, perhaps neoliberalism versus classical liberalism. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's fair that we kind of work in a classical liberal tradition. So it's not, um, you know, it's, it's really more a difference of tone more than anything else. But I think um, it, it, at least among the sort of neoliberals that, um, you know, that, 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 that I encounter or people who kind of don't mind the label, I think it's this kind of twin commitment to democracy, um, including potentially a quite a large state because, you know, democracies grow, they develop state capacity, um, uh, they they also develop and regulate markets. So it's like these things, these kind of good things often seem to come together. Whereas like a more traditional classical liberal conception would be like, hmm, I don't know about, about all this democracy going on here. Do we really need quite so many levels? Couldn't we just maybe limit the way that, the way that government operates and just keep it, you know, keep it nice and cheap and, and operating at a very thin layer and then not having anything like that, you know, um, uh, that 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 sort of that sort of thing, and it, and it might turn out that that actually um, you can't really have markets that are sustainable unless they're constantly being legitimated through uh, democratic practice as well. But it goes the other way uh, that you need you need markets, um, as you say, as, as a kind of arena where people learn the um, the virtues of democratic practice as well. And I feel this is very much in line with, I suppose, rules and intuitions. It's just something that is like a little, it's, it's, it's missing from a little piece of the puzzle. It, unfortunately, it's a piece that, that other rulesians are, are very, very keen to keep away. But it's basically, they're, they're totally down with the argument for like these virtues being developed, these moral powers being developed in civil associations. So churches, sports um, activities, families, all these kinds of things that we think of as very familiar places where you would learn how to, you know, get on well with other people. Um, they, 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 they acknowledge this is very important in addition to the political arena. So they say the political arena is, is, is important as, as well, the, the, the public sphere. Um, uh, and all I'm saying is that there's a certain component, which is this ability to get on well with uh, strangers um, who you don't really know very well, apart from the fact that you know that there's potential gains from trade. Um, I'm just saying that that, in addition to all those things, is also important. Um, so, uh, and uh, I've, I've tried to make the argument in the book. I've, I've tried to make it uh, subsequently in another article, and I'm continuing to try and make that argument. But um, uh, it, it, you know, it, and we'll see. Maybe, maybe one day it will, um, it'll like get a, it'll, it'll, it'll get, it will get in there. But I, I think it's, it's something that. Um, that that Rawlsians, you know, there's a lot of arguments that I make that I think Rawlsians go, yeah, that's that's okay. This particular thing about economic liberties being critical for moral development, they find a really, really, uh, a really, really hard thing to kind of um, uh, to uh, to accept. And yeah, so just have to continue and just just see, just uh, you know, see see how how that goes, and just try and learn more about about what they're concerned about. Sure, I mean it's controversial because so many people are um, very aware of and committed to a belief that market activity is primarily corrupting. So if, if something is so corrupting to you, if it's forcing us to view each other transactionally, um, and, and I think this might get back to the different understandings of what a market is. Is a market something that just exists and operates on you and is requiring you to be transactional? Or is it something that you actually have to be a cooperative social human being to participate in on some level? Um, which connects more to this process formulation of people needing to be actively engaged in order to 
allow the economy to become informed of their values and needs and to bring their innovations and their entrepreneurship to the table. So I, I think, you know, my colleagues, Virgil Storr and Ginny Choi recently wrote this book um, called Do Markets Corrupt Our Morals that deals with a lot of these themes. But I think at the root of it, a lot of that interpretation and that view of markets either being pro-social or anti-social, I think it I think it has to do with those very core theories of what we even understand a market to be. I think that's right. Yeah. So if you've got the neoclassical conception and you've kind of got this idea that, you know, it's a very instrumental kind of set of mechanisms, then yes, now you can see how it's it's neutral at best, corrupting at worst. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so it's it's uh, yeah so this is quite a different kind of framework that I'm 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 kind of operating and uh, yeah no it's a it's a it's a question I I mean I think I think um, uh, uh, Choi and Store have done very well at kind of bringing out all the evidence that we have it's a t- it's a tough question to get evidence on because it's quite in a sense it's quite an abstract argument but I think of all the evidence that we have I think they've shown okay. that you know. There's a tendency, you know, that it, that can easily be distorted, but there's a tendency towards markets, you know, ameliorating corruption rather than increasing it. But um, yeah, we um, yeah, it, it, it's 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 a it's a hard intuition for 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 some people to um to 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 accept. So in the final section of the book, you deal with uh, some questions of once we move our understanding of institutions beyond that veil and we're thinking about these institutions as operating in the real world, that's going to have some policy implications. So, so this, this different understanding of, of how institutions operate will, uh, you know, might affect how we think about which policies are more and less desirable. Um, and specifically, you devote a lot of, of real estate in here to the concept of property owning democracy. Mm-hmm. And how it differs or maybe is not so different in its real instantiations from welfare state capitalism. Um, and maybe this is kind of a hard question because those are both really big tent concepts. Um, but can you just, you know, give us a, a picture here of what the what what property owning democracy is? And what you think its relationship is to some of the the welfare state capitalisms that we that we see around the world? Yeah. So um, I, I, I was recently um, uh, informed by a uh, uh, by an empirical economist, Ryan Murphy, at uh, Southern Methodist University, that apparently there is something approaching a real world property owning democracy. At least there was in 1970s in Malta. Uh, I, I think I think he put some numbers into his spreadsheet and he kind of goes, okay, this is, this is pretty much what it is before, before he told me this, I'm still going to look, I'm looking out for, for this discussion because I think it's going to, I think it's going to be forthcoming because I'm fascinated to discover that a property owning democracy actually existed. Um, but before then, uh, before now, I just assumed that a property owning democracy was a kind of theory that, um, you know, it's, it's an idea, it's a radical alternative to capitalism uh, or at least that's how it's classified by uh, by um, uh, Rawlsians. And the idea is it attempts to break up capital assets uh, through both pre-distribution, so kind of putting in policies that are meant to prevent the agglomeration of capital in the first place, uh, as well as redistribution, so that everyone has a kind of share. Um, and it is supposedly a radical alternative to capitalism, but only insofar as capitalism is defined by its opponents as intrinsically based on a class distinction between workers and capitalists. So people who own capital and people who have to work for, for a living and only, you know, all their all their income comes from working. Now, my point in the book is that this definition is Marxian. Uh, despite it being a preferred idea by some high liberals. They don't think that's a particular problem. They say, we need to include Marx. Marx has got something important to say about about this. And he does have important things to say, but possibly not about the definition of capitalism. Um, In fact, real world capitalism, as well as the more idealized capitalism that I support, you know, so I'm not not like um, looking to legitimize the status quo. Um, But I think the real world capitalism is quite comfortable with the blurring of the identity of worker and capitalist. Uh, as shown by the rise of home ownership and uh, access to pensions, 
if we are looking at distributing uh, capital more widely, then what we're talking about is a matter of degree rather than a qualitative difference between so-called welfare state capitalism and property-owning democracy. It would be very hard to tell the difference once we drop this sort of very strident Marxian definition between a kind of slightly weak property-owning democracy and a strongish welfare state capitalism, because the, the, it, it's not really clear how property-owning democracy is really escaping from, from the notion of capitalism if you are willing to drop that class distinction. Now, the Nobel Prize winning economist James Mead invented the notion of property-owning democracy as deployed by contemporary Rawlsians. What's interesting is that actually the same words of property-owning democracy is also used by kind of Thatcherites. Um, and there is a connection between the two, but like obviously not in terms of the overall ethos because you know, Thatcherism is considered very much on the centre-right. Um, uh, now, Mead um, also was a solidly mainstream influence on tax and savings policies in the United Kingdom. He wrote for mainstream think tanks such as the Institute for Fiscal Studies um, and um, the establishment of individual savings accounts, which allow for things like holding stocks and shares at a kind of uh, at a, a kind of uh, um, on a, on very very good tax terms, uh, they were part of you know kind of reforms under New Labour. Uh, so you know a kind of like should we say a centre left you know somewhat neoliberal kind of approach, um, and that is actually a reflection of Mead's influence. You know he, he was sort of talking about these these sort of processes for trying to encourage wider capital ownership. So we have bits and pieces of property and democracy already implemented. Uh, and if the results are disappointing, then it's partly because, you know, we face various realistic challenges uh, when we're trying to implement uh, these, the, the, these things in the real world. Uh, and, and it's not necessarily because um, there's a set of policies out there that we can, like, take off the peg from theory and just implement. You know, these policies have been out there. They have, to some extent, been implemented. And, um, you know, they, they, they probably had some positive, probably occasionally some negative impacts. Um, but the, the results that we see today, you know, including the, in, the equalities and the inequalities of the current regime in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, that, that, that's a, a, as a result of these ideas already being in the fray. So it's not a kind of like, you know, utopic kind of um, uh, scheme. It's, uh, it's something that's already been implemented and uh, it, it, it should be considered um, on on the sort of realistic terms in which in which we find ourselves. Yeah. So you already mentioned a couple areas for possible consideration in terms of policy areas in which existing policies may, in some places, be actually exacerbating inequality and uh, discouraging the mobility of capital. Um, which policy areas do you think are kind of most uh, the, the areas that we should be most looking to reform if we want to make progress along these lines of pursuing liberal equality in a just way that does not compromise our ability to have a successful market and economic sector in which policy areas are you are you looking at as being most critical there and and you know how exactly would changing those rules wind up translating into better outcomes from your perspective within this framework well um i i place a lot of um emphasis in the book on housing policy uh, and I think, you know, I think this is something that's sort of coming to the fore from like multiple uh, a, a kind of um, uh, a kind of fronts. And it's um, it, it, I think there's a, there's a kind of irony here because um, James Mead uh, was quite supportive, I think, as many people were at the time of um, the um, uh, the Town and Country Planning Act that sort of came in immediately after World War Two in the in the UK and effectively nationalized planning permission. Um, so in other words, we, we suddenly put a big, big cap on how development was going to happen in the in the UK forevermore, unless unless ever that that law, law gets uh, reformed. And th there are some tentative attempts to reform um, uh, policy in the UK now. Um, there are parts of the US that have similar problems, and they also tend to be concentrated in areas that are like high productivity areas. So places like San Francisco um, and uh, to a lesser extent, New York, where, you know, where housing restrictions mean that you could have people 
moving in, um, earning a good income, because they would be, you know, through benefits of agglomeration and being near high productivity enterprises, but are kept out uh, because of uh, scarcity of, of of housing, which is, you know, not due to physical limitations, but due to legal limitations and basically a legal system that tends to prioritize the preferences of existing residents over potential entrants. So it's got this, that's the, um, th- th- that's what these systems that are, you know, in, in the UK were introduced post-war. And I think were introduced during the progressive era in, in the United States and have just been, you know, building up ever, 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 ever since. Um, and this is, this is a big problem, you know, from, if you look at inequality metrics, you find that a big chunk of the recent rise in inequality is due to uh, a, a, um, a rise in asset prices. Uh, and many of those are going to be, uh, you know, housing and home ownership um, that's kind of this, this dr- driving that. So it's like um, home ownership that makes existing homeowners richer on paper, but also kind of stuck. They're not going to find it as easy to move, especially if you've got like a large mortgage. It's, it's, it becomes more complicated to move if you're engaging in a much larger transaction that you'd, you'd commonly be in, in, interested in. Um, so, so, uh, but, but at least they've got an appreciating asset, which is like and super appreciating in the UK. Like it's gone up enormous amounts in in recent decades. Um, and then you've got people who haven't got um, uh, homes who then have to make very specific trade offs. Uh, very, very fraught trade-offs in terms of what kind of commute they're going to put up with, um, where they're going to work, um, uh, how much, and, and 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 you know what can they afford. So they tend to do things like delay starting families uh, and, and and that sort of thing if they're interested in getting um, their uh, you know their professional life off the ground. Because in order to be in these like high productivity areas, they're giving more and more of their income over to um, to, uh, uh, to 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 pay to, to pay for rental housing. Um, so there's there's an there's an inequality issue there, but there's also a productivity issue there as well. So there's there's all kinds of things kind of uh, um, uh, mixed in. Uh, so one policy, I mean, I, I suggest we need to find ways, you know, of um, of uh, deregulating or at least easing up land use um, supply, so that preferably we can end up with more concentration. Um, I think that that would be good from an environmental perspective as well. I think it's good to have agglomerations of people in in in, in cities, um, but um, we we should be looking to do that. Um, and also uh, potentially we could um, alter the tax system so that we have in the UK at least a tax on imputed rent, which basically means that rather than charging the fairly low rates for council tax housing that we that we do now. And it's sort of like grandfathered in from around 1991 or so. It hasn't been updated since. Um, we'd have, instead we'd have a tax on the the uh, rent that your uh, the, the house that you own that you're living in could accrue. And that would cut, that would go towards, that would go into your income tax as well. Um, and the idea there is not to kind of try and, well, I'm not trying to, um, uh, you know, attack homeowners. In fact, I am quite recently a homeowner myself, so I'm not, I'm not incentivized to do that either. But rather, I think we need to change the political economic incentives so that um, the, sorry, the political economy incentives so that um, uh, homeowners realize that the costs of, uh, of their homes are not just going to be a pure benefit to them. In fact, they're going to start costing them. And so, for, for, for that reason, they should be more amenable to a bit of uh, growth in areas where there's high demand for, for housing. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of other areas that I kind of suggest are, are important. I mean, the intangible economy is now huge. So, you know, things like um, intellectual property, patents and uh, branding um, and uh, I suppose software and, and things like that. That's all very that's all very important. Uh, for, for the economy and also where you see um you know some of the growth in, in inequality at the real top end um and for that i, I kind of say that it's bizarre bizarrely a lot of um policies uh, at, at the moment are actually aimed if anything at augmenting the power or rather the the property protections in that in that area rather than allowing these you know people who, who are doing perfectly fine by themselves in protecting their doing very well for themselves and uh, protecting their their intangible property instead we've kind of got these this sort of um biased actually quite nationalist approach which basically says well we need we need controls over this property so that uh, so that we can uh, uh, tax it higher 
Um, but this, this has a problem in terms of uh, increasing the profits for a, a few relatively small organization uh, organizations. And at the same time, also uh, making consumer goods more expensive for everyone else. Um, so there's, there's a few reasons uh, where I think that we can kind of reform intellectual property so that we basically squeeze more value for the consumer out without sort of giving over more more money to capitalists. It's very interesting because when you look at like each individual policy, um, they're often very beneficial to individual types of businesses. I think this is like, it's quite familiar to public choice uh, people, but like the overall ethos is quite, shall we say, like anti-market or anti-business. We look at the detail. It's like, there are all these kinds of policies that are actually going to be substantially increasing profits for people who don't need any help. They're doing, they're doing perfectly fine. So I, I say that that's kind of where you want to focus. You want to focus on the rules rather than um, observing people under your currently unfair and kind of unwieldy system grow extremely rich and going like, oh, I think we should tax them a bit more. It's like that's that's not kind of what, you know, that's that's not where that's not really where the problem lies. Um, and, and I suppose one final thing is a kind of word of warning, because a lot of, uh, you know, property only democracy enthusiasts or left Rawlsians, um, they're maybe not so keen anymore. But when I was writing the book, you know, you know, three or four years ago, I suppose it's been a long, long run in. Um, it, it, there was a lot of emphasis on the role of education. It would be an egalitarian uh, kind of um, uh, is is the source for 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 equality, and it was something that New Labour always in 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 the United Kingdom always made a big deal out of as well. That if you if you just got everyone a college degree, then suddenly everything's going to be fine. Um, and the thing is, is that you know many Rawlsians like myself are in the higher education business. Uh, and so naturally, they have seen the flaws in our existing capitalist system, especially in businesses that they don't really know, you know, they don't really have that much direct um, experience of. That That is where the, all the flaws are. They don't see anywhere in the way academia is practiced right now. Um, and so like all special interests, our answer as people in higher education is typically, oh, well, you know what, we, we need more support for our sector. Um, so we need more money, more grants, more this, more that. Um uh, more support from the government. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that higher education is important. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be working in it if it if, if it wasn't. But at the same time, there is a kind of curious way in which, ironically, this approach kind of slightly commodifies higher education in the sense it's basically saying, well, the more you spend on higher education, the better it's going to be. And, you um, my point is that, you know, there's a knowledge problem and to some extent an incentive problem associated with delivering a higher education as well. Uh, we don't quite know what people are getting out of it. At least we don't know what they're getting out of it until many, many years later when we find out how well they're faring in the long run in, in the in the labour market. Um, and uh, some of the stuff that we're we're doing in, in higher education is probably not very supportive, certainly to the marginal student. You know, we should be more focused on trying to improve what um, what they can do. And it might be that just ever more years of education, because it's getting to the stage where now so many people are taking undergraduate degrees. We now say, oh, well, now you really need a master's degree as well to get anywhere. It's like you have to think at some point there's got to be some diminishing marginal returns um, on, on, on that. And um, uh, we should be looking quite critically at uh, at whether higher education is at present a um, a contributor to equality, or maybe in some you know devilish way some contrib- some in some form a contributor to inequality, especially if we're looking at you know kind of the encouragement of people to take on like non dischargeable student loans and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's that's my thoughts on on what we what we can do on in terms of policy at the moment. But the most important thing I would say is housing. Yeah, I. I agree with all of those points. Um, I, and I don't want to talk myself out of a job either, but we had Deanna Thomas on earlier in an earlier episode, and she talked about her work on the potential uh, regressive impacts of regulation. And I think a lot of these policies that are designed to increase access to, to give people who are less advantaged, more opportunity, which I, I think that's what like first time homeowner credits are intended to do. Of course, obviously that's what um, educational subsidies are, are on the surface intended to do, but they often do wind up having this regressive character once they're actually created in reality, in part because the way these laws get crafted and maintained is 
subject to these public choice problems where it's people who already have more access that get to craft and structure how these work. And then, you know, once you set up these subsidies for home ownership, you now have this group of people who have this asset that they have a super strong incentive to protect that, you know, the mass of people who might want to move into that neighborhood someday are never going to have nearly as strong of an incentive to to advocate for increased uh, increased access. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of, I, I think you've done a fantastic job in this book, bringing some of these public choice problems into this issue, into this, uh, this area of discussion, and also just suggesting some really concrete policy areas where if we pursue improvement in these, you know, in housing, in the way we think about encouraging education and what we think about taking on debt for, um, that we can really make meaningful change that is going to, you know, increase opportunity, increase this ability for people to experiment um, in their own lives. And we don't have to totally rewrite our institutions from the ground up. These are all marginal changes that I think a lot of people can agree with with the principles around which they're structured and, and actually have an opportunity to be, you know, implemented in reality. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, we need to to wrap up here. We're out of time. I know we didn't get you know a, a chance to discuss nearly everything. Nearly, you know nearly uh, half of what you, you know, touch on in this book. Mm -hmm. um, but just, you know, thank you for offering this to us as food for thought. Well, th thanks, Jamie. Obviously, I'm, I'm very keen to carry on the conversation at another another time. We can always, uh, we can always do this again. Um, but it's been great. Um, yeah, it's, it's been it's been great uh, talking to you and catching up with you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason, as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.